Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual event at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Melissa Kane. I'm a lawyer and journalist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. We would like to take a moment to thank the members, donors, and supporters for helping to make this program and all other Commonwealth Club programs possible. We're grateful for your support, and we hope you will continue to support the club during these uncertain times. Uh, today, I'm very excited. We've already been chatting like old friends for a while. I'm so excited to welcome Montana Senator John Tester to the program. He's the author of a new book called Grounded, a Senator's Lessons on Winning Back Rural America. Uh, Senator Tester has represented Montana since his election in 2006, when he defeated incumbent Senator Conrad Burns. Uh, Senator Tester has a work ethic rooted in authenticity. He's the only U.S. Senator with a real job. He's a full-time farmer, <laughs> and today he uses his experience to advocate for rural America by grounding his work in his community and reaching beyond party lines to make that happen. Now, this book, Grounded, tells Senator Tester's story of growing up in rural America, his start in the Democratic Party, and his strategies for how Democrats can reach red state voters. Now, he understands the importance of the rural vote, and he ensures that his community's issues are heard and accounted for. Senator Tester highlights how staying true to traditional values can actually preserve American democracy and guarantee all voices are heard by those in power. His voice is one that can help a divided America by creating common ground in the nation's ubiquitous values. Now, today we're going to be discussing a lot. We're going to be talking about current events. We're going to be talking about Senate confirmation hearings, all sorts of good stuff. But we're also going to start with a uh, talk about the book and uh, talk a little bit about uh Senator Tester's background and history. If you're watching with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and in the comments on Facebook, and we will be getting to those a little bit later in the program. But for now, please allow me to welcome Senator Tester. Thank you so much for joining us. Melissa, well, it's, it's indeed a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. I'm looking forward to this. Well, so let's just start, you know, a lot of people write a book before they maybe run for president or run for higher office. Do you, is that why you wrote this? Do you have an announcement to make? Uh, I have, I have no announcement to make, Melissa. I, uh, by the way, the, the first time I was asked about that, when I told somebody I was writing a book, they said, oh, you must be running for president. <laughs> now, um, I, I, I am not, uh, I, I wrote the book, quite frankly, because I, I think that there are opportunities in rural America that Democrats aren't taking advantage of. And, uh, uh, I think that if you look at the values of the, uh, of the Democrats around this country and what they stand for, whether it's affordable, accessible health care, quality public education, or taking care of our veterans, investing in the infrastructure, those are all things that Democrats stand for, and they're all really, really important things in rural America, too. So I, I, wrote, it, I wrote it to, to, to hopefully uh, send a message, both to rural voters and, and to the Democratic Party that says, hey, there's opportunity out there to make sure your voices are being heard, and there's opportunities out there to uh, to uh, to represent uh, you know vast swaths of this nation that, uh, quite frankly, there aren't a lot of Democrats in. For those uh, folks, maybe in California or elsewhere, who aren't as familiar with you and your background, could you tell us um, some about your history, your upbringing, your deep roots there in Montana? I think you've been out on the farm today, actually. I I think I saw some white paint on your hands or something. You're actually no, you, 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 you busted me there. I, uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, for full disclosure, I've, I've got uh, some bulk fuel tanks that were, uh, the paint was starting to go and I need to repaint them white. And so uh, I just got them done before I walked in here to sit down with you. And so, uh, so you're right. But, but, you know, that's, that's what happens when you're a working farmer. And I, I am a working farmer, and uh, before I get into my history, that the reason I do that is because I think that's how the forefathers set it up. So you had a citizen legislature, and so that people had to make a living uh, in that environment. It's how our state government is set up, our legislature is set up, and I think it's a very, very good form of government where people, in our case, in Montana's case, for 90 days on odd years, go to Helena and make laws, and then they leave Helena and have to live under those laws they've made. But as far as I go, um, look, I, I was I was born 50 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I went to college 75 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Um, I uh, uh, got a degree in 
in music and, and got really, really lucky and was able to marry a very, very talented, solid uh, woman that, that is, is uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without her. Um, in the meantime, had all the experiences up to that point of growing up on a farm from picking rocks to picking bales to driving tractor to harvesting uh, the works. Uh, that's what you did if, if you were a farm kid. Uh, we were 12 miles away from where the action was in Big Sandy, Montana. So you didn't get in a lot of trouble if the folks had you working. And then went to college, got a degree in music, came back, uh, taught music for a couple of years, uh, then uh, took over the family butcher shop. All, the whole time we, just, we were farming, um, made the conversion to organic agriculture in the late 80s uh, and have been doing that ever since. Uh, served on all, just about every local board there was from soil conservation to school board to getting elected to the state legislature and then to the United States Senate. Um, I wanted to get into the, the state legislature is something that intrigued me from when I was in high school, uh, but never thought about going any higher than that. Um, but but the truth is, is it uh, uh, had an opportunity to run for the United States Senate in 2006, was encouraged by a number of people, including my wife, to do that, uh, and my and my mother, who was still alive then, and my brothers, and uh, and decided to, to take that leap. And, uh, and you know, uh, it's, it's been an interesting experience. I've served at a very interesting time in this country's history. <laughs> So, now you say in the book that you wanted to be a farmer. You knew you wanted to be a farmer when you were eight years old. You had decided this yeah. was it. you were you were raised on this farm. You were going to stay there and be a farmer. Uh, what is it about farming that uh, that that appealed to you then, and, and does it still? So, um, so I've got two older brothers. Okay, and and they they weren't um, although. My middle brother was only 15 or 16 at the time. So, uh, you know, you don't make all your life choices at that age. So he could have done back. Thank goodness is right. But uh, my oldest brother was, was, uh, was by the time I was eight, he was married and, uh, and uh, was, was living uh, in Great Falls, Montana, 75 miles away from here. And, uh, and I always like to be outside and I always like to be working. I always like to have my hands in the dirt and, I just, I just loved the farm. I mean, I just liked it. And, and part of it was probably the way it was presented to me by my folks. Uh, part of it was, part of it was, is the, the place that we're on is the place that my grandfather homesteaded and my grandfather lived till I was about six. And I remember him, but vaguely now at, at age 64, but, but he was, he was a big man and he was a powerful man. And, and I, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be somebody who worked and worked hard and, and got things done. And, um, and, you know, even at age eight, that's, that's, I don't know, I don't know what it was, Melissa. I mean, I wish I could tell you that, you know, uh, something happened that said this is what I'll do, but it was just, I want to do it. One, I mean, one day that the, the folks said, you know, uh, I don't know who's going to take over the farm. And I said, I'm done. And I was eight years old. And I, I thought that for some time. And they said, really? That's what you want to do? And I said, yeah, you're damn right. That's uh, <laughs> something I want to do. So, it, it, and you know what? I'm, I'm, I truly am the luckiest man in the world. I, I get to serve in the United States Senate, which some would say is the most exclusive club in this country. It certainly has lost some of its luster over the last few years. But, but I get to serve in that body. And then I get to work on the farm, raising food to help feed the world. Uh, it's it's an amazing life, and uh, and I'm always a farmer first. I said that in the book, and and you know that Melissa just talking to me. But but the bottom line is is that uh, I'm incredibly honored with being able to serve in the Senate, and I've got to meet some marvelous people both here in Montana and that I served with in in Washington D.C. This in California, and especially the Bay Area, we have um, uh, a hobby. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, it might be called something like real estate dreaming. And that's where we go on like a Zillow or a Redfin and we look up <laughs> what we could what we could live in in another place for what we're paying <laughs> to live in the Bay Area. And so you go, oh, wow, I could have a pool or, you know, it's just it's this uh, this thing that we do to pass the time sometimes. And I full disclosure, Montana is on my 
sort of real estate dream list. I sort of go through and uh, and look at the beautiful estates and uh, and other places that are available there. So I'm definitely biased, but yeah. um, this book is very much a love letter to the state of Montana, the land, the people there, not just your family, but uh, but families that go back, uh, other families that go back generations. And um, can you talk a little bit about about that? Because there's, you know, it's called Grounded. It's about, you know, sort of your connection to to the ground, to yeah. the land. Um, but it seems like such a big part of, of how you think of yourself. Um, you know, I, I wish I could block the telephone right now, but that's not just like, I just hung up on the guy or gal or whatever it was. But, Sorry. But I, no, that's, it's, 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 it's cool. But 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 get get to your point. I mean, the 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 truth of the matter is is that I I've got I've gotten to be raised with a lot of characters, a lot of uh, incredibly big personalities in this little town called Big Sandy, who peaked population at about a thousand people uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, now it's at about six hundred, and and it's typical of most rural towns around the country. It's it's losing population, and it's unfortunate because because it's it's not uh, it's not what it once was. Let's just put it that way. But but the truth is, I I got to be around uh, a lot of people, and and of course a, a person's folks are, are their main influence. But but teachers and and neighbors and and all those folks teach you lessons, uh, life lessons every day. And uh, and 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 I I just I just think that there are incredible values in rural America, and I'm not saying urban America doesn't have them too. I think they do actually, but 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 values like you know when somebody shakes your hand and then looks you in the eye and tells you something, um, you you got a deal. You don't have to have it written on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be notarized, uh, you know, because a person's word is their bond. And uh, and that's true in almost every case here, where where um, you know people people will come on and you make a deal and. Deal's a deal. It's done. And and uh, uh, I mean, I still sell a fair amount of grain that way. I'll I'll call up the guy who I sell, you know, more than half my grain to, and he'll say, "Yeah, I'll give you so much a bushel for it, and I should be able to take it in such and such a month." And I says, "Okay, sounds good." And uh, you know, and he may or may not send me a written contract, but the truth is, is that that I know that it's there. I think that's a great quality, by the way. I think I think it's really really good. And then the other quality that that is very prevalent uh, in, in rural America is, is neighbor help and neighbor. Um, you know, we've, we've got, my granddad put up a big hip root barn here. It was, it's what they did when they moved from North Dakota to Montana. It's the first thing they did. They didn't build a house, they built a barn. And, uh, and all the neighbors pitched in and, and did it. And this wasn't the only barn that was built out here. I mean, there were a lot of hip root barns out in this prairie, you know, 70, 80 years ago. A lot of them have blown down now and there's only a few left, but, but the truth is, is that, that that's how the community was built. When a church needed to be built, everybody got together and, and you know, they built it. When a community hall needed to be built, that's what they did. So lending a help and a hand to one another is another thing that, that I think really is, is, is something that, that rural America does and, and continues to do quite well, by the way. If, if somebody gets in a bind, the neighbors are always there to help them out. And, uh, and I think that's important. Well, you have you also have a sort of three generation deep ties to Montana. Now, in California, in the Bay Area, you know, so many of us are are transplants from other places, uh, and we're you know quite used to voting for people or having our leaders be uh, you know some of them are you know have been here for generations, but it's not as much of a prerequisite but but you've you talk in your book about how you know authenticity and being uh, an authentic montanan if that's a word uh is is uh is really important um and something that you've been able to to rely on to to get support yeah no absolutely i mean i think that 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 uh you need to know the state and you need to know the environment and, and this this is the environment i'm talking about of, of personalities and in communities and things like that, and, and I think that if, if if you know that you don't have to fake it. If you don't know it, then you start faking it. You lose your authenticity, and then you're done. I mean, you're just done. And and I, and I think that Montanans, you know, there's there's a number of people. Some of my best friends have moved into this state uh, from other places, and they're good people. 
but none of them try to be something that they aren't, you know what I mean? And, and, and I think that's, that's important too. I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the things that happened to me when, 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 when I was running for office all three times is, is oftentimes my opponents would try to change themselves, you know, uh, and make themselves into something that they weren't. Uh, and, and hey, you have a lot of fun with the one from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, you, the one from Maryland, I had the most. Fun. Was it Maryland or I wanted to say, Maryland. okay. Yeah. I apologize. Maryland. Yes. And, um, and, and the truth is, is that uh, the reason I had so much fun is because, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, he tried to be a rancher, you know, he bought a new pair of gloves and bought a coat and bought a pair of cowboy boots. And he forgot to buy cows. I mean, you know, and so that's, that's, that's a hard one to uh, fight when you claim to be a rancher and you, and you get up and, you know, and, and talk about fix and fence and all that stuff. And it really didn't cut it. And people <laughs> that pretty, 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 uh, pretty amazing. But what was the word that you had for billionaires who come to Montana to ranch? Um, Wow. Let's see. Now you're putting me on the spot. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, no, I, it's, uh, t- tell me. Uh, it's, uh, I can't, I can't remember. When you were, there was some word that you guys use. It's not glamping, but it's something like that. It's, um, it's, uh, this word for, because there's so much of it now, it gets a word that yeah. uh, <laughs> wealthy people moving to Montana, sort of buying up large swaths of land and, and to your point, buying, buying the clothes. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah. Wi Fi out there, just, you know, asking for a friend. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the truth is, is that, that that's, um, that's good and bad. I mean, people coming in buying land is, is a good thing. Uh, people, people coming in buying land and, and, and locking it off so people don't have access for hunting and fishing and using it for their own private uh, fishing hole. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that where that land was open before when the old, the, the old rancher had it and, and, and now it's closed off. That kind of stuff tends to irk people. Let's just put it that way. Um, cause, because the outdoors are such a big part of Montana. Uh, they're a huge part. Now, there's the, Montana politics is so interesting, right? There's such a there is a, a very it seems like a, a, a robust and genuine libertarian, uh, and that sort of to your point about yes. wanting to be able to roam free and uh, sort of uh, you know be free from government regulation and other kinds of um, and other kinds of restrictions. And it's also a state I was just, I, I, I feel like I knew this, but I read it and I thought, huh, uh, the, the number one state for ticket splitting in terms of, you know, you're, they'll vote for a Republican for president, for example, and then vote for a member of Congress or the Senate who's a Democrat. Why is it that there's um, all this sort of uh, independence generally uh, in Montana politics? It is, it, that's a very good question. I, I think part of it has to do with, we're a big state with just about a million people, a little over a million people in our state. And so, you know, Ted Schwinnen, who was a governor for the state of Montana in the 80s, told me that if you run for statewide office, you have either looked at or shook hands with everybody who's going to vote for you and vote against you. And, and I think that's part of the ticket splitting. I think that if, if you're able to see the person, talk to the person, meet the person, see the person in action, oftentimes that's of more value than whether they're a D or an R. And, and I think that, that that's, that's something that, that, that Montanans value. The other thing is I tell folks that you've got to give them, you've got to give people in Montana a reason to vote for you. And, and if, if you're able to do that and, and it's something that they value, um, then they'll support you. But then you've got to follow through or, or they'll boot you out next time around. So, I mean, the, the, the truth is, is that if you give them a reason, though, um, they'll support you as long as you're authentic and as long as you show up. Now, um, former Governor Bullock is running for Senate now, right? Um, and President Trump won Montana <clears throat> with like a 20 point That's correct. advantage in 2016. Do you think you'll see maybe another ticket split or what do you think is necessarily gonna happen there both in terms of the Bullock race and also uh, in terms of the presidential race for Montana? So when uh, in 2016, when, when President Trump won Montana, I think by 21 plus percentage points, Steve Bullock won governor, I think by five percentage points. Uh, that's a prime example of people who split tickets. I think 
uh, I think Steve Bullock's going to win this election in November. And the reason I think he's going to win this election isn't because he's a Democrat and isn't, he isn't it for any other reason other than he has a record of accomplishment that he can point to and show the people of Montana that when he told them something, he followed through. And Montanans appreciate that. And so I think that is going to be a close race. Yeah, it's going to be a close race because that's typically what happens in Montana. But I do think that gives Bullock an edge in this election. And I also think that Donald Trump's going to win this state. That's not breaking news. I think everybody probably figured that. Uh, the question is going to be, is he going to win by 5, 10, or 15? Um, I doubt it's going to be more than 15. I suspect it'll probably be more than 5. Uh, but the truth is, is that I don't think it's going to be anything like it was in 2016 in Montana. Do you see uh, Joe Biden planning on any trips to Montana or the president? I know you talked a bit you know, just now, really, about sort of the importance of of coming there and having a face-to-face -face conversation, asking for the vote, giving them a reason. Uh, yeah. And yet, you know, are, are the presidential candidates coming through at all? You know, d does that matter? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, typically they don't. And uh, we haven't seen uh, any this time. We, we saw Vice President Pence come to the state, uh, but not for uh, not for President Trump, for, for, the, for the, the sitting senator. Um, I, th I think that... Um, I would I would love to have them come. Um, uh, Joe, Joe did come to the state a couple years ago and spoke at a, a dinner we had a year and a half ago. Um, and, and, and Joe Biden has connections to the state through Mike Mansfield. Uh, he tells a, a wonderful story about the fact, actually it's, it's a heartbreaking story, but it turned into be a wonderful story where his wife and, and child got killed in, in a car wreck. Um, and he was ripped up and he had two other kids that were in the hospital. He had just been elected. This happened between election day and time of swearing in. And Joe wasn't going to go. He just wasn't going to. And I understand what he was thinking. Was, my family needs me. I, I'm not going to go to the United States Senate. Mike Mansfield went to the hospital and said, hey, we need you. And basically swore him in in the hospital and told him that he'd work with him to make his, his life and his, his family a priority. And, uh, and, and Joe Biden tells this story much, much better than I just did, by the way. But the truth is, the truth is, is it, it, it is a Montana connection that's real. And it's one of the reasons that, my, first of all, Mike Mansfield is one of the class acts that ever served in Washington, D.C. And it's also one of the reasons why Joe Biden's on the ballot to be potentially the next president of the United States. So um, it's, it's a pretty cool story. And But I would love to have him come in. Uh, but But really... Uh, you know, President Obama came in in 2008 a number of times, um, and it was close. I mean, it was close uh, uh, with uh, with John McCain that year. But but uh, but the bottom line is is that you can't expect to win if you don't show up, and so that's that's part of the deal. Uh, and just for our viewers out there, Mike Mansfield is a former senator, represented Montana, whose seat you actually now. That's correct. He was the uh, longest, longest serving majority leader in the United States Senate. I think he still has that record. He was a diplomat to uh, Japan and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's historic around here. I mean, he's just, he's one of the giants of politics in the state of Montana and uh, uh, somebody who I saw, but never met, uh, wished I would have, uh, but uh, is, is, had an amazing career in public service. And, uh, and continues to be legendary in the state. Now, you tell the story about how when you were elected to the U.S. Senate, it was the was the first time that you and your wife had been to Washington D.C. I think that's what I remember that you 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 went to the Capitol for the first time to to you know find your office you know in the, in the yeah. U.S. Senate. That's kind of amazing. We have an audience question here um, that is uh, is it hard being the only Democrat in your state's congressional delegation? Uh, even if it's only three seats, uh, or does it make you have to build relationships uh, across the aisle? Well, it, it, look, I mean, I, I think whether we were all Democrats or there were two Democrats, one Republican, there's one Democrat, two Republicans now, you still want to work across the aisle because that's how Montana was built by people working together. And it's just kind of inherent to who I am. So you, you, you continue to look for people to work across the aisle with. Um, and, and look, we're, we're working to change uh, that makeup this next election and uh, potentially that makeup could change. But I don't it's I wouldn't say it's hard. It's certainly it, it doesn't rise in the top 10. I'll tell you that or even the top 20 of difficult things that we have to deal with in Washington, D.C. 
Well, now going back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago with regard to the importance of showing up and and having that face-to-face conversation. And one of the criticisms that you make in the book or, or pieces of advice that you give to the Democrats in the book is that they need to show up and um, and stop sort of writing off large swaths of rural America as, you know, either deplorables or just not gettable. Uh, and so, you know, you sort of skip every other house or something like that. So um, can you talk a little bit about why you think um, that is one of the important lessons that Democrats need to learn about how to how to win there? Because to your point, there are some messages that Democrats have that um, that, that could be uh, persuasive. And, and that's it, Melissa. I think that if, if Democrats show up and talk about uh, let, let me put it this way. Let's put it in the order. If Democrats show up and listen, uh, because you've got two ears and one mouth, act accordingly. Listen to the folks, hear what they have to say, and then talk about solutions. And I think the challenge that you'll hear in rural America, um, Democrats have solutions for them. So it's not like you have to go outside your comfort box as a candidate. Just listen to them, hear what they say, and then talk about what you can do to move the ball forward to help help them out. And I think that's really important, but 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 I will tell you when I ran for the state legislature in 1998 for the state legislature, uh, I learned something very important. I was a, you know I, like I said I served on all the local boards, but I was a neophyte when it came to to a, a bigger election that where you actually had to buy campaign ads and put up signs and knock on doors. And what I found in that election is is that uh, you know they'd give you advice. They'd say take this. This is before you had iPads. They'd take this clipboard out. And it'll show you which houses to knock on. Well, you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm missing three fingers. I don't handle a clipboard very well. And, uh, you know, I'd have paper flying all over and pencil flying So I just said, to hell with that. I'm going to knock on every door. And I'm going to ask them for their vote. And, I'm gonna, and the ones that are really nice to me, I'm going to ask if I can have a sign location in their yard. And, and guess what happened? And that, and that little exercise, we knocked on every door either with lit drops or me personally knock on them five times, is that we won that election in, in, in a district that was 10 points favorable for Republicans. And I remember after the election, I had a, a guy come up to me who was a Republican and said, I voted for you. And you know why? And I said, no, why'd you vote for him? And he said, because if you work half as hard as a state legislator as you did campaigning, you're going to be one hell of a state legislator. And, <laughs> and that's, that's the truth. I mean, people appreciate hard work in rural America. I think they do in urban America, too. And if you knock on every door, you never know. You never know what you're going to get. And so if you show up to a state like Montana or Kansas or, or you know, Oklahoma, you never know what can happen. You, you, you talk to the folks and you listen to them. And now, time becomes a problem, and, and there's never, ever enough time. But uh, what I would recommend to candidates who are running, um, if you're thinking about running, you ought to start doing that stuff pretty early, uh, even before uh, the primary season comes on. And that way you've introduced yourself to a whole new set of folks that could, could potentially help you out if you do get the nomination and you do end up where Joe Biden is right now. Well, for Democrats, I mean, there are, uh, we have a question here, sort of what do progressives in rural states have to offer the Democratic Party broadly? And I think you had you had talked about a, a couple of things at the beginning. One, one was um, veterans support. Uh, and uh, one was public education. Can you talk more about what it is that Democrats offer that, that could actually be um, be popular? Well, I'll, I'll start with the most important issue and that, that is in this election, and it's health care. And Democrats have fought for accessible, affordable health care and continue to fight for that, tooth and nail. Um, if I'm a Republican, I can't make that. I can make that claim, but it's not an honest claim. I'll just be honest with you, because the President of the United States is suing in court right now to take away things like pre-existing conditions and lifetime caps. And, and I get it. I watch the candidates. They say, oh, I'd never do that. But the truth is they're supporting the lawsuit. And, <laughs> and I've, I've yet to see a plan that takes care of pre-existing conditions that, that people are going to vote on. That's number one. So healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. It is the biggest issue out there. Uh, and from a personal standpoint, as a small business person, uh, as a working person, it's a huge issue. And when you live in a, in a place in Montana, and sorry about the clock, but if, when you live in a place in Montana where we have a small hospital that was built basically 50 years after my grandfather patented the land that we're on, and now it's a little over 50 years past that, and if we screw this up, that hospital's gone. It will never be rebuilt. 
And that means instead of going 12 miles to town, if you screw up and put your hand in a meat grinder, now you got to drive 50 miles one way mm -hmm. and one way. And, and that becomes a real problem. And if you're over the age of 50, that's going to further take down the possibility of living in a town like Big Sandy because of access to health care. So the, it goes on and on and on. And the impacts health care in rural America, public education. Oh, man. Look, uh, it is the foundation of our democracy. Uh, there are people out there who right and left are trying to undo public education, and it's not Democrats that are doing this. And I think we need to invest in public education. We need to make it all it can be. It is absolutely something that's, it, that is a rural value. If you don't believe me, walk into a small town, go into the bar and start bad mouthing the school, and you'll get run out of town. They, they value their schools, and, and they, they really do. And, and I'm telling you that public education, good public education, accountable public education is critically important in rural America. It's critically important for this country too, by the way. If we lose sight of that, we're making a big, big mistake. Look, a place like Montana, we serve in the military at a higher rate than, than a lot of states. So taking care of our veterans is something that's really, really, really important to everybody. Uh, everybody's related to a veteran or is a veteran. And so um, taking care of them is important. Infrastructure, we're a rural state. We're a long ways from San Francisco. And some of our product gets sold in San Francisco. We didn't have good transportation systems, whether that's highways or rails or air service. If we don't have good broadband, uh, then that kind of stuff really has some negative impacts on our ability to make a living. So th those are what I see, three or four things that, that, that quite frankly, Democrats stand for that, that, uh, that rural America, you know, would agree with, I think. Well, you also talk a little bit in the book about this subject, and we have an audience question about the, um, the, the issue of tariffs. With um, with China and how that potentially impacts rural America, what um, the question is? What do you hear from your fellow Montanans about how the tariff war in China has impacted um, their lives and and their votes? So I can tell you, it's one of the damnest things I've ever seen. Uh, I'm a farmer, um, and and I know what it's done to the price of grain. You can blame it on COVID, but it ain't COVID. It's the tariffs. Um, it's what happens when you go into a trade war. Uh, with somebody and you've pushed away all your allies and you don't have a plan. And that's what the president has done here. And what it ended up doing is ended up taking away markets and it's ended up increasing input costs, particularly in steel and aluminum. And by the way, farmers buy a fair amount of that stuff because mm -hmm. tractors, combines, cattle guards, bins, the works. So, so the end, the end result is it's, it's decreased the profitability in rural America. Now what the president has done, to make up for that is cut checks to farmers. And it's interesting that uh, one of President Trump's talking points on Joe Biden is it's going to be a socialist country. Last time I checked, you start cutting federal checks to farmers, that's socialism, okay? And so it, 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 it's interesting that we've been, and, and rightfully so, by the way, because the trade wars haven't worked, we've been bailed out by the American taxpayer. And and quite frankly, if, if, we, if the president had gone in with a plan and had some allies with him, he could have held China accountable. He has not done that now. So, so it's had some negative impacts. Now, as far as the vote goes, um, you know, um, whether it's because Democrats haven't talked about their vision for rural America uh, enough, or whether it's because uh, they really think Joe, uh, that Donald Trump has done a good job, you know, of, fair number of the rural votes, the vast majority of the rural votes are probably going to go to Donald Trump. But if people sat back and looked at what he's done um, and saw the impacts on their wallet, he shouldn't get a vote coming out of rural America. Well, what are you hearing What are you hearing from Montanans about um, the sort of unrest that we've seen in some cities, um, certainly protests that sometimes have turned um, violent, um, you know, sort of identity politics, these kinds of things that the president is, you know, associating and we're, and that our other people may associate with the Democrats. What, as a Democrat, what are people telling you about their perception of your party? Well, I mean, look, uh, I, there's not a lot of folks talking about um, any sort of demonstrations or riots that are going on here. It's, it's, it's a long ways from here, by the way, but there have been 
a number of um, demonstrations in, in the bigger towns around Montana, um, talking about equal justice and, and fair treatment under the law, which, by the way, is is fundamental to this country, and uh, and, and we need to recognize that. Uh, uh, all you have to do is say the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, and and you and you'll understand. And that's something we said every day in school. So 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 I don't hear a lot about it. But if I was going to um, bring up the issue, I think that most Montanans uh, don't like to see the violence at all. But yet I think most Montanans think people have the right to demonstrate um, and, and should be, and, and that's not a bad thing. That's part of what makes messages get through to elected folks like me. And, and it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily bad at all, but violence, uh, not acceptable. Well, on the subject of sort of race relations, we do have a question here. It says, uh, when Wilmot Collins, Wilmot Collins was elected mayor of, of, Helen, of Helena in 2016, he became the first black mayor Montana has ever had since statehood. Um, is this a sign of progress for Montana? I don't know. We'll find out. I mean, I think uh, we'll, see, we'll see how things move forward uh, uh, for Wilmot and, and his job as mayor and for, for potentially, we don't, we do not have a lot of diversity in the state. I mean, we've got about six or 7% Native American and, and a percent or two of, uh, of, uh, of African Americans and Pacific Islanders and those kind of folks, Hispanics, uh, but, but we don't have a lot of diversity. Uh, so uh, Wilmot, who's, who's a heck of a good guy, uh, I like him a lot. It's just going to depend on who gets the urge to run, but he, he, he ran, he, he ran a good campaign and, uh, and he won. Uh, he's, he's got some turmoil right now going on in Helena, Montana, but uh, we'll see how a lot shakes out. Um, what's the turmoil? Well, there's a, there's a group of folks that, uh, it, was, it has to do with a city commissioner. Um, and I, I'm getting this through the papers, a city commissioner and, and meetings, uh, they were disposed of, fired, uh, and maybe not done the right way and hired people were hired to take the place, maybe not done the right way. Um, look, I, I think that government needs to be absolutely open uh, to everybody. And uh, if you're going to do things, getting public input's a good thing. And I'm not saying what he did was wrong or right or anything like that, because I don't know enough about it to pass judgment. Uh, but, but the truth is, is that uh, there's been a little dust up that's been in the Helena Independent Record uh, regularly. Oh, wow. Well, um, one of the other things you talk a lot about in the book, and one of your major beefs with the whole system <laughs> as the, the farmer legislator, one of your most important observations is related to dark money. And you talk a lot about the Citizens United case and how that, um, because you, you actually were in elections that straddled that yes. decision so you could actually see the the different impacts can you talk about your experience and we have an audience question and, and that uh, audience member who wrote this uh it's in the book but uh, i'll ask him here to comment on it um it says please comment on montana's rejection of the citizens united ruling you know you had, you had the sort of plebiscite or referendum there um and uh so if you could talk about your experience and and your how your state had you know tried mightily to uh to reject that ruling get around it yeah, so uh, folks who understand Montana and understand uh, Butte America um, and understand what happened with the Copper Kings uh, over 100 years ago uh, understand that Montanans don't think corporations are people. They don't. Uh, and they don't think that rich people ought to be able to buy elections. Uh, they don't. Uh, they believe the power is with the person and, and the vote. And, uh, and Montanans for the most part, don't like to see gobs of money come flying into states like Montana uh, to try to, uh, to uh, you know, promote or dissuade people from voting or not voting for a person. And uh, and it's been part of our history for over 100 years now. And so when the Supreme Court came in and said corporations were people and they could give a bunch of money, that that, that leaves a bad taste in, in their mouths and doesn't really pass the smell test either. And And then... And then when they take off all the caps and say you can put as much money as you want into these elections, that's another problem. And then when they say you don't have to disclose who you are, to put money into you know the C4s that are out there, uh, so that we don't know if it's 
one person or 10,000 people who are putting money into the pot to try to, to dissuade people from voting for you because most all of them are negative ads. Uh, it, it becomes, it, it's a real problem. And, and I, I can tell you that it cuts across political lines. I, I think that there are as many uh, Democrats as Republicans that don't like the dark money. Unfortunately, when you get to Washington, D.C., it's a different story. And uh, so when you, when you get a, when you get a, a bill, and I've had numbers, a number of bills to, to make it so corporations aren't people, um, you, have, you have a floor leader who won't allow those bills to even get to the floor, uh, won't allow any any uh, campaign finance bills to get to the floor, period. I mean, we, we got a big victory last year because um, the, the Senate now has to do what the House has done for years and years, and that's file electronically so that people can find out who donated to their campaigns instead of a month later right away because you're firing electronically. But, but that's a win. That's a pretty minor thing to do in, in campaigns, actually. It was my bill, so I, I can say that. Um, it was it was a pretty small step. It was a good step. It was a step in the right direction. But 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 why not pass something that says, you know, you can't deduct the funds that are going to these C4s, uh, not even for educational purposes. Why not pass a bill that says uh, uh, corporations aren't people? I'd probably take a constitutional amendment. I don't know. But the truth is they aren't. I mean, I've never seen a corporation go to jail ever. And quite frankly, I serve with 99 other people and not one of them are a corporation. They're all people. And so sure. any, I'm not, uh, <laughs> you're right. I'll take that back. Let me, uh, let me, the, but the truth is, is it, it's crazy. I mean, it's just crazy. And what the Supreme Court's done to our finance, our election finance laws is, is totally unacceptable. And I think disastrous for our democracy and bad for both Democrats and Republicans. Well, you know, I think Montana, you probably get it even worse than others, because if you think about a bang for your buck equation, right, you've got a million or so people in Montana that you need to persuade. And if you persuade some percentage of that million, you get one or two Senate seats, you know, like the, the exchange is, you know, it's a good investment as, 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 as this goes in terms of, you know, if you look at it that way, whereas in place like California, where you have many, many more millions of people, you're going to have to persuade so many more people to get a, get sort of the same rung of power as you can get in Montana for, you know, ideally less money, but, you know, but still a lot, still a flood for the the poor folks in Montana who uh, who are sitting ducks there come uh, you know election season. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the truth is, is that uh, I just watched the Senate debate last night, and I think one of the candidates said this election would probably be close to ninety million dollars for six hundred thousand votes. That's uh, that's insane. I mean, look, uh, that money could be used to buy books, right, or it could be used to heat houses or pay school teachers more money or pay firefighters and police officers or whatever the heck you want to use it on, it would be better spent than just run a bunch of ads and tick people off. So there's, there's opportunities here, by the way, to fix this problem. It's not like putting a man on the moon. Uh, it's, it's about, it's about getting people together and, and, and working to fix it. And, and look, I, uh, some people would say, let's just have entire public financing. And that's one school of thought. Other people would say, let's have a hybrid version of it. Other people would say, let's just put caps on it and make all the money transparent. I, 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 at this moment in time, I'm open to anything because quite frankly, it's a gross waste of money right now. Um, I, well, I have, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is just a little personal pet peeve. As someone who's had to research campaign spending, uh, even the, the things that the campaigns themselves report, which, you know, doesn't include a lot of dark money, but even just the, the you know, John Tester for Senate um, at the FEC, they often will report credit card payments without what it, what it was for. And so it'll oh, say like $50,000 for Amex. And it's like, well, that that's useless. What, what, much. what was yeah. that for? <laughs> and so you, you, there's no sort of underlying, anyway, that's just my personal that's okay. not that's, be, I'm just like, uh. that's a reasonable gripe. And if I've ever done that, let me know and I'll give my book. No, 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 not you. I just mean, you know, um, you can have, I think that that's, 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 that's <laughs> the truth is that's part of being transparent. That's part about letting people know what's going on. It's why I put my schedule online. It's why I, you know, have town hall meetings. It, it, it's why you need to do that. That $2,000 Amex is a fair chunk of change. You know, if, 
what was it used for? Was it used to buy cigars to hand out to the staff? Because if it was, that's probably not a good use of campaign dollars. Was it used to was it used to buy yard signs to put up in people's yards? That's a different story, you know. So and they should have to they should have to atomize that anyway. Sorry, I digress. Um, but let's talk about and you know, we've got a little while left, and I do want to talk about the subject. Now you're going to have to go um, and sort of dig into this, you know, Supreme Court justice confirmation. Now you were there during the Kavanaugh. Um, I mean, Gorsuch not not as contentious, but Kavanaugh certainly, and also, and now here we here we come with another one. Tell tell me about what you learned from the prior experience, what you think is going to happen here. Um, do you think uh, uh, Judge Barrett will be confirmed? So uh, I'll tell you what I've learned. Um, I've learned that there's two sets of rules in the United States Senate for Supreme Court justices. There's a set of rules if you're a Democratic president, uh, when Scalia passes um, eight or 10 months before the election, then they say, nope. We're not going to consider it. Mr. McDonald says we're not going to consider it because we want the voters to have a say. Okay. And then I find out when Justice Ginsburg passes about 50 days before the election that all of a sudden we're going to crown, we're going to jam that person through. And the voters' opinion really doesn't matter now because there's a Republican president. I think that hypocrisy is unbelievable, and I don't think it's good for the body and certainly not good for the country. If you're going to have a set of rules, live by the rules. Um, and, and quite frankly, to morph those rules in one direction to meet the political good of one party, uh, I think is a huge mistake for the country. And, uh, and I couldn't, uh, I, think, I think, by the way, what's going on right now in the Senate is going to change the way the Senate works forever. I think it's going to take an incredibly, um, a, a very gifted leader to get in charge of the Senate to bring that body back together. Because I'm telling you, Mitch McConnell has fractured that body every way, but every way possible. And it isn't good for the country. The Senate's always been the place where you've taken the time, you've done things right. Uh, and maybe a Supreme Court justice confirmation is the most important job the Senate has to do. And Mitch McConnell now is ramming it through um, for political reasons. Uh, I, do you I don't think there's I don't, anything the Democrats can do. Is there a, is there a plan? I know I've heard of, you know, maybe boycotting the vote or. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, I don't know that, that any of that stuff is, uh, gets you to a point where you're going to stop anything, quite frankly. Uh, Mitch McConnell's changed the rules on, on super uh, Supreme court, nominees so that it's a simple majority he has a simple majority and so he can put that lifetime appointment on the court with a simple majority um i, I think that the best thing that, that what i'm doing and i think what other people are doing is talking about the impacts the supreme court justice could have on health care on workers rights on voting rights on everything because quite frankly the supreme court could potentially touch any piece of legislation that comes out of Congress and is signed by the president. And so if people understand how important it is, maybe they'll put pressure on their own senators to say, whoa, if the rule was good enough for Obama, it's good enough for Trump. Take your time, do it right. Find out if this person is the right person for this lifetime appointment. And uh, that, that's now, whoever it. wins is going to probably get to appoint somebody in the next couple of years. I mean, we've got, I mean, there's several yeah, justices getting, who are pretty high yeah. up there yeah they're, they're they're getting up in age you know which i very seldom talk about because so am i but uh but the <laughs> aren't, we is, <laughs> aren't we all yeah the, the, that's true so i mean look the, the uh the you're right there there, there are going to be uh other appointments made and then the question becomes are we going to change the rules back if we have a democratic president or is it going to be different for a republican it just is messy and it, it doesn't it just doesn't doesn't smell right. Um, I have a question here, and you write in the book, and it's it's something that I can't even imagine. You said that you talk about how the first time you heard the president take aim at you, like that the president said, 
and Senator Tester, you know, and you were like, oh, that's me. Uh, when President Trump came after you. And, and so this this person who asked this question says that um, President Trump campaigned hard against you in Montana in 2018. That's also in the book, Viewer. So you should check that out. Um, and, he's, and you still won, of course. Um, and so does that show some of the limits of, of that outside money and influence in a place like Montana? I can tell you in California, you know, we've got, you know, the cemetery is full of the bones of of people who tried <laughs> to buy an election here i couldn't actually do it um is that someplace we can put hope that people don't always go for that yeah i mean look i mean i think that, that there is a diminishing return on the amount of dollars that are spent in campaigns i mean uh, if, if you're in montana right now i guarantee you if you turn on the tv you're gonna you're probably gonna hear half a dozen campaigns every half hour Heck, half a dozen commercials every half hour. So it does have some impacts on that. I, I, I think also that the, the advantage I had is I, I had served for 12 years. Montanans knew who I was. So when President Trump came to Montana and started spewing all this stuff about me, uh, it didn't mesh with what Montanans knew. And so it was less effective. Um, uh, if, if I'd have been a new person <clears throat> and the president would have came, he could have probably branded me in a way that wouldn't have been recoverable. But since I had 12 years of track record, um, you know, and, and after you're in for 12 years, the people who are going to vote against you are absolutely going to vote against you. And the people who are going to vote for you are going to vote for you. And the others who may be persuadable are not going to be persuadable by stuff that isn't factual. And what he was saying simply was not factual. Wow, Montanans care about facts. Interesting. <laughs> Which... Well, I mean, in this particular case, they did. And, and I would like to think that Montanans care about facts all the time, quite frankly. But, uh, but we'll see. The president, the president gets away saying some crazy stuff that no other politician could ever get away with. And I do not understand how it happens. But it does. Um, the taxes that were just reported is a prime example. Do you think that that will matter to Montanans? Because one of the things you talk about in the book is the frugality and sort of um, uh, and the patriotism of the people yep. there and how um, one of the things Democrats and Republicans need to learn is to kind of rein it in. Uh, and so what uh, what do you think that this might actually break through um, and and cause some people to to maybe rethink their vote for him? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that if people actually believed he didn't pay his taxes, yes, it would have it has some impacts. The president has diminish the value of the press to the point where anything that comes that's said negative about him, he says it's fake news. And there's a lot of people out there that believe that. But the truth is, is you, you hit on something that's absolutely 100% correct. What my folks said paying taxes is your patriotic duty. That's how we keep this country having good highways and police protection and fire protection and good sewer and water and how we protect ourselves from foes that want to do us harm. And for, for this guy, a millionaire, to pay no taxes or 750 bucks in 2012 or whatever it was. I, I don't know the years, but the truth is he paid 1500 bucks is the story I heard in 15 years. Uh, I've got to tell you what, um, he's, uh, uh, that, that, that should not sell with Montanans. I will tell you that because Montanans are concerned about things with the debt. They want to make sure your books are balanced. They want to make sure everybody pays their fair share. And, and quite frankly, if they accept this guy doing this kind of stuff, it is against the norm from a Montana perspective. Uh, now, how do you answer? Now, so in California, we have our two senators and this whole uh, confirmation debate has stirred up uh, again, this debate over um, why some states have two senators and they represent a million people or half right. a million people, however you want to, you know, figure it yeah. out. And then, and then you have other folks who have to run to represent 40 million people and, yeah. and that, that, that there's, a potential for either a constitutional amendment or some consternation there. How do you, how do you um, sort of answer or deal with those kind of, and maybe jealousy, but or, but, uh, but th those kind of criticisms of of the system? Are you concerned that it may actually change at some point if things keep going the way they have? Well, uh, look, um, yeah, I am actually, and it, and it's not because of California having I think thirty eight million people, right? That's what you have in California. Is it forty now? Anyway, <laughs> give or take, being among friends. Uh, you have two senators. Montana has 
a million, 100,000 people say, and that might be rounding up. Um, and we've got two senators. Um, the forefathers I thought were genius because they set the Senate up to be the place that took the time and had the discussions and had the debate and was the deliberative body to really temper what the House was doing. Now, under Mitch McConnell's rule, under his rules, Senate isn't a hell of a lot different than the House, other than we have six-year terms and they have two. It's a simple majority. And quite frankly, there's no debate anymore. Hardly any bills go through committee to get public input and try to get bipartisan support. So yeah, I think Mitch McConnell's put that at risk. And I think it would be a mistake. But uh, but nonetheless, um, I don't I don't think the body serves the same function it did that the forefathers had in mind. And I'm not a, a political scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but that's just kind of how I view it right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you ever get flack from like the Californians? <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, look, it's not necessarily Californians. I mean, Texans and Floridians and everybody. I mean, you know, we're what Vermont's got six hundred thousand, and South Dakota's got six or seven hundred thousand. North Dakota's probably about the same place we're at. But but the bottom line is is that uh, uh, you know I mean we're, we have one uh, representative of the House of Representatives serving a million plus people, and most states have it at about one to six fifty, I think. Um, so uh, you know there's advantages and disadvantages going down going up and down, but, but, but in, in the end, I've, I've always thought that it, it, it's a system that has worked and worked pretty darn well. Unfortunately, uh, we've got people in Congress right now who are trying to destroy that system, in my opinion. Uh, now, I do want to talk about elections, because you have an interesting history with elections, and it's something we're probably going to see again this year. And California has been doing mail, you know, sort of free mail ballot elections for many years. So we're kind of used to it. We know election night doesn't mean you're going to know who won here. Right. Uh, in other states, they're going to experience this some for the first time. It may cause some confusion. You may win on election night and then not, you know, the next day. But you have had, <laughs> for various reasons, all of your elections, uh, all your Senate elections, at least, were these sort of protracted um you know, deals where you had to sort of wait till the next day to figure, or, or, or after that, to figure out if you had won. What, um, what, how do you think that's going to help you understand these elections and, and, you know, and try to try to talk to people about uh, how they shouldn't get too jumpy on election night? Well, I think the key thing is people need to register and they need to vote. They need to vote early uh, and, and track your ballots and make sure they get into the clerk, of course, uh, the clerk and recorder's office. Um, I think that once those ballots are in, then I think you give give the, give the election officials the time to be able to do their job and don't get antsy. Uh, just let them do the counting. I guarantee you there's going to be people because the president did a last election uh, with uh, Cinema and McSally uh, where Cinema was down election night and he got up and said McSally's won and then the rest of the votes came in and they counted those and, and Cinema ended up winning. So I, I, I could almost guarantee you there's going to be claims of victory made far, far, far too premature. And I just think as a voter, your, your obligation is to make sure you vote, uh, make sure that ballot gets, gets to the proper place, which is the clerk and reporter's office, and then, and then be patient. And I think uh, there will be plenty of people out there that are going to be saying, you know, the, there's still 20% of the ballots out or 20% of the ballots haven't been counted or whatever the number might be. And in many cases, that's that how those ballots are, how those ballots are, are voted. You're going to make a determination uh, who the winner or loser is. So it's not going to be decided until the end. And, and, and you're right, my three elections to the United States Senate, none of them were called till the next day. And, uh, and look, I would love to be able to go to bed knowing who the winner was but uh but you know what we waited the next day and things turned out just fine anyway so it was good do you think who do you think whoever is the new uh justice on the um supreme court should recuse themselves if they've if there's some sort of you know we end up in a bush v gore kind of situation where the the court has to weigh in on some not necessarily declaring a winner but i just mean declaring you know some sort of legal principle that could influence the outcome 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it probably should be the case. I mean, the truth is, though, is we should wait till after the next president and Congress is sworn in to, to confirm the next Supreme Court justice. That's the fair way to do it. Well, I have a question here from a Montanan, a constituent who wants to know, uh, do you think we could re-implement some form of the fairness doctrine to help stem disinformation? Wow, boy, do I wish. Uh, that, that would be cool to, to make sure that you're hearing both sides of the story. Uh, it certainly uh, is, is not, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty bad right now. I mean, it's, it's been bad for a while, though, quite frankly, long before this president came in, where uh, I'm not saying the news media isn't telling the truth. They're just telling one side of the story. And it'd be nice to have it so that they'd have to tell both sides and give equal time. So you like that, but, but I don't. I like it, but I don't see it. I don't see it changing. Now we have time for just um, another question. We're here with Senator John Tester with his book Grounded, uh, and so I did want to ask. So the, the subtitle is "A Senator's Lessons for Winning Back Rural America." And presuming, presumably, you mean for Democrats. <laughs> um, and so we talked about a couple of things. One is knock on every door. Um, the other, which um, you may want to elaborate on, is um, to be a little more frugal and not just be sort of not have money always be um, the answer because folks like to, to as you said, balance the books uh, yeah. out there. Um, what uh, what else should they be doing tactically to um, to reach out and maybe win the hearts and minds of some some Montana yeah. men? Well, well, I alluded to this, and, and I think that oftentimes that, that politicians, public servants, whatever you want to call them, tend to tell people what they want them to hear from them. And I think a much more effective way is to listen first and, and listen to what they're saying. And then, and then and as you listen to what they're saying, plug that information into what you stand for. And so that you can talk about, all right, so for high college education, you know, the high cost of tuition or uh, this is what I'm doing, and 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 talk about that. I think, I think that's 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 really important is to listen first. Um, you know, I, I think just we we've, we've touched on most all of this stuff. I mean, showing up, being authentic, trying not to try not to be somebody else because people see through that pretty fast, and uh, that doesn't win you votes. Um, you know, if if you're a lawyer and you wear a suit well. Don't put on a bunch of jeans and, and leather gloves and try to act like a farmer. It doesn't work. Just be a lawyer. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's and, funny. You write about it in the book, but it's something that we've missed this season is all the, like, the Iowa State Fair where there's, you know, the, everyone's out trying to pretend like they love corn dogs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> we all know better. It's so phony. Uh, and so you know, they're all out there in their brand new jeans, you know. <laughs> um, trying, trying to you know be be out there of the people. Now you do write in the book about a couple of inst a couple of uh, I won't say arguments, but um, you know conversations with Chuck Schumer. Uh, do you think that the the other folks in the Democratic establishment are uh, receptive to your advice? Are they um, interested in what you've had to say? Yeah, it just depends on who you're talking to. And and look, I think that's the big difference between the Democrats and the Republicans right now. Republicans tend to fall in line and never challenge their leader. And I guarantee if you had Chuck Schumer on this program, he would say, that's not my life. I get challenged all the time by folks on the far left, by folks that are moderates all the time on what I'm doing. And I think that's good. I think that's, that's healthy. And, and I think that it, it's, it's, it's part of a, of a good leader that listens to that and, and tries to make the right decision listening to everybody. Whereas when the Supreme Court's a prime example, and there's many, many other uh, things before that too, that, uh, that uh, McConnell will say, do this, and they say, yes, sir. And they just jump in line like a bunch of sheep and follow. <laughs> Democrats. I love these guys, man. I, I mean, I love them all. I mean, I, well, maybe not all of them, but the vast majority of them, I love them. They're good people. I can't figure it out. They're smarter than that. And it's not just about power. It shouldn't be just about power. If it's about power, Americans lose. I'm talking about political power now. If you're doing this to keep Republicans in power, it's a big mistake. And it'd be a big mistake for Democrats too. I mean, the truth is, is we have a systems of checks and balances. They aren't working and they need to work. And it only happens when people stand up when they see something that isn't right and say, stop, that's not right. And if it costs you your seat, it costs you your seat, big deal. You know what, this, this Senate's a great job for me, but it ain't the best job I ever had. And I bet you most of the people who serve will tell you the same thing. Wow. 
you know, I had another question, but I'm just not going to top that. I think that is just, <laughs> just a great summary of your approach as set forth here in the book Grounded, A Senator's Lessons on Winning Back Rural America. Thank you so much, Senator, for taking time out of both of your jobs to join us here today. Uh, the book is being sold at all places where books are sold. And there's also an audio book out. I just want to plug. I listened to it. It was great. Senator Tester himself actually narrates it. It's quite good. Uh, and if you want to see more programs from the Commonwealth Club, be sure to make our virtual programming effective by going to commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Melissa Kane. Thank you everyone for tuning in and stay safe out there. Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 200 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, university presidents, and noted health experts. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.